Entrepreneur Mark Cuban never calls time out. I always look at business as a sport. In, in football, you play 60 minutes. Basketball, you play 48 minutes. In business, it's 24 by 7 by 365, and the whole world is trying to kick your ass. I will never forget talking to Mark about, you know, where are you going with this broadcast thing? And he goes, I'm going to the BBC, Billionaire Boys Club. Mark Cuban parlayed his passion for Indiana basketball into a company worth $5.7 billion. The day that Broadcast.com was sold to Yahoo, I think a lot of folks felt like we had hit the lottery twice. Over the last 20 years, I've always been about what's new, what's next, and how am I getting there first? The unorthodox entrepreneur has disrupted every business he touched. He said, we got to blow this up. This is not what I want. Rip everything out and start again. He's been slammed. Eliminated. Mark Cuban, furious. And investigated. Mark Cuban, ordered to appear before the SEC. But almost always comes out on top. He is smart. Being one of the smartest people. But he also, you could make the argument, was one of the luckiest people in the age of the Internet. Somebody has got to be the luckiest person in the world. Somebody's got to be, right? <laughs> it's you. And I'm just glad it's me. <laughs> you know? It appears that they are for sale on a game-by-game -game basis, but I can't figure out how to buy them. So Mark Cuban going. got in at the beginning of the Internet boom, and it served him well. His gold mine was called Broadcast.com, one of the first Internet sites to stream events live. Everything from Victoria's Secret models to countless sporting events. We were the first ones to scale internet broadcasting, you know, to take 500 radio stations and broadcast them on the internet, 100 television stations, earnings calls, product launches, college football games, deals with the NHL, Major League Baseball. I mean, we had really become a broadcast network on the internet. The fiercely independent entrepreneur has blazed a trail into TV, movies, NBA ownership, and he even stars on a TV show though he declined to participate in this one. Mark has been an entrepreneur from the moment the word was invented, <laughs> before it meant drug deal. Mark Cuban was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and grew up in a suburb called Mount Lebanon. From the get-go, Cuban was a moneymaker, selling trash bags, newspapers, and even postage stamps. I started a stamp company. I started with a quarter and bought a stamp and left with $50, thinking, hey, if I could do this, I could do anything. By the time he was 16, he had already built a reputation. Brian Cuban is his younger brother. I remember Mark being given $5,000 by one of our neighbors to go buy stamps in New York with my father. You know, he was always the entrepreneur at stamp shows. But that just shows you, at that age, what people thought of his ability to make money. That skill only grew at Indiana University. The tireless business major taught disco, started a chain letter, and decided to run a bar if he could come up with $15,000. Evan Williams was an engineer at General Motors who played on the school rugby club with Mark Cuban. He was at my house one day. He was calling banks to try to get a loan so he could buy this bar. So on my way out, I said, hey, Mark, if you have any problems getting that loan just give me a call two days later he goes hey Ev so I ended up late 1979 loaning Mark fifteen thousand dollars so he could buy a bar in Bloomington Cuban awarded Williams stock certificate number one and within months opened his bar Motley's Wayne Winston teaches graduate statistics at Indiana University in my over 35 years of teaching I've never had a student really start a business while they were an undergrad or an MBA here on campus. And he started Motley's, which became by far, I think, the best bar in town. The business model he used in Motley's is very close to the same business models he used in his next two or three businesses. He always would have 51% of it, even though he didn't put up any of his own money. But no one really complained because he was the one that built up the business until it came crashing down after a wet t-shirt contest. It's pretty common knowledge around town. An underage girl won a wet t-shirt contest. And so I think that hurt the future of the bar, let's put it that way. Cuban graduated and soon landed in Dallas. Within a year, the born entrepreneur launched Micro Solutions, 
providing software, hardware, and training to businesses at the dawn of the PC revolution. It was a family affair. Marcos, you come work for me. So I said, fine. So my first day at work, you know, I'm a big lawyer. I show up in my suit and tie. And he goes, why are you wearing that? Well, you know, come to work for you at Microsolution. He goes, no, go home and change. Put on your crappy clothes and your jeans. You're in the stock room. <laughs> Mark doesn't give you anything. You have to learn it and earn it. Mark Cuban learned the computer business fast and in seven years sold his company to CompuServe for $6 million. And I retired. And you retired. And what yeah. did you do with that money, your biggest purchase? My biggest purchase, I um, bought a lifetime pass on American Airlines and I had one mission in mind. I, I wanted to be Party. able to go to as many countries around the world as I could and get drunk with as many people as I possibly could and I was so good at it. In 1995, Mark Cuban came out of early retirement to reinvent radio. According to Cuban, college friend Todd Wagner brought him the concept. It's a story the Hoosiers basketball fan has told often, as in this interview on 60 Minutes. He sat me down and he said, look, I've got this idea where I think we can listen to Indiana basketball sporting events, you know, anywhere in the world by using the Internet. So Mark and I just basically said, let's find out if this is a business or not. So we set up shop in his upstairs bedroom of his house and, you know, got us a computer, got the software and started playing with it. And that is the birth of AudioNet, what eventually became Broadcast.com. But another young entrepreneur tells a different story. Chris Jabe says he was also a founder of the company. When I was pretty young, I was a Minnesota Twins fan, I moved to Texas. So I was a Displaced fan, I was always trying to figure out how to get access to those games that I couldn't see on regular TV. When the internet came along, it's like it was a slam dunk, because now it was just a matter of acquiring broadcast rights. He took his plan to investors. One of them was Cuban. I probably had this pitch that I'd given to maybe 150 people over the previous year and a half to two years. And so I'm getting into my pitch. It's usually about a 20-minute pitch, and within three minutes, he goes, I'm in. I'll do it. Jabe asks for a million dollars and said that Cuban wrote a check for 10000 and months later tried to cut him out completely. Mark said, Chris, I really don't need you. You really don't have that much to add. I can pretty much do or get people to do what you're doing. So I was a little bummed, to say the least. And I really give Todd a lot of credit. When he came to me and said, you know, we can work a deal with, you know, for 2500 a month and 10% of the company, in the way he described it and the way he showed me the paperwork, I knew it was real. And it really made me feel really good, actually. Even though it was hard to take 10% of a company that I developed 100% you know, from scratch. Cuban became the driving force of AudioNet. Mark overall really wanted to see it as his company. He had made it gone from really an idea to reality. He never really wanted to acknowledge me as a founder. But co-founder Todd Wagner does acknowledge Jabe's participation. He was there for a very brief period of time, and then he went on to the next thing. He owned a slug of equity and did just fine. AudioNet did better than just fine. Never before in the history of the world can you come in and listen to almost any team from anywhere in the world. You know, a little PC and a connection to the net, and you might as well be sitting in Bloomington, Indiana. Then you'd go back in there, and all they did was have all these servers with all these different sporting events going on and people trying to keep the servers up. So you're like, what is going on in here? They're planning a nuclear strike. And, you know, but it was controlled chaos in there, keeping all those servers up and all the, the game streaming. It was pretty cool. Cuban and Wagner changed the name from AudioNet to Broadcast.com in 1998 and positioned the company to go public. The Internet boom was in full swing, and on July 17th, the stock hit the market, priced at $18 a share. The first trade pops up, and it was, you know, $63 or whatever it was. I mean, it was just through the roof. Nada Usina led the sports properties and marketing departments at the company. I recall our head of HR popping her head out of a cube like a game of whack-a-mole and saying, we opened at whatever the number was. And everyone looked up and we thought, she missed by a decimal. She must be wrong. And we all started to look and you could just see heads popping out and the excitement in the room. It was literally like a parade went off. The stock closed at 62.75.
At the time, it set a record for the highest percentage increase on an opening day. I'm the first to realize that luck plays a huge part in it. Um, I happened to, to have a company, Broadcast.com, that went public at the right time when the Internet stock market was going nuts. Cuban wanted to expand their content and was looking for a breakout event. He found it in lingerie. There were a lot of pinnacle events for Broadcast.com, and one of those was certainly the Victoria's Secret webcast. Wrapping high-tech with high fashion, the webcast was a phenomenon. Millions of people tuned in, and it became the largest viewed event ever on the web. We like to position it as uh, the first sold-out event on the Internet. It helped to cement us as the go-to place if you wanted to do something multimedia on the Internet. Jeff Sweeney is an entrepreneur and friend of Cubans from Dallas. I will never forget talking to Mark about, you know, where are you going with this broadcast thing? And he goes, I'm going to the BBC, Billionaire Boys Club. You're not going to make a billion dollars on this thing. I mean, you're going to make a hundred million dollars. No, 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 dude, no. BBC, dude. That's what I'm doing. In pursuit of that billion, Cuban and Wagner led the charge straight to the executive offices of Yahoo. I remember Mark and I going into the conference room and basically just saying, look, we're where you guys need to be. So you're either going to have to compete with us or you're going to have to buy us because we are big players in where we think the Internet's going to go. Yahoo felt the breath of competition, according to Paul Sappho, a leading technology forecaster. It's a moment where there's a sense of the rise of the machines. Algorithms in the form of Google are really taking over the search space. And it's beginning to dawn on people that, in fact, there is a lot of volatility and customer loyalty around places you visit on the web. I can remember going to Yahoo, and you could just feel the anxiety at the company of how do we bulk up our technology side. Looking for an answer, in April 1999, Yahoo grabbed Broadcast.com for a staggering sum, $5.7 billion in stock. The deal secured Cuban's membership in that billionaire's club. I think a lot of folks felt like we had hit the lottery twice. You had this tremendous IPO, and to top it off, one of the, the great companies in Silicon Valley, Yahoo, comes in and acquires this little old company that was set up in Deep Ellum, Dallas, Texas. Uh, it couldn't have been, frankly, scripted any better. But not scripted all that well for Yahoo. It is so easy to quarterback this thing. And as people say, it's one of the stupidest moves in the history of the Internet. But there was so much stupidity in that period. It was like a single note in a vast symphony of stupidity. Yahoo struggled with their new acquisition. It's pretty simple to, to see what happened if you were on the inside. Uh, you had a $5 billion acquisition handed to a number of NBAs who had never actually integrated anything before. Yahoo really took a pounding. They took their eye off the ball of search, which opened the door for Google, who smoked them. Within months of the buyout, Cuban protected his stock by buying puts and calls against his interest and began to cash out buying a 24,000-square-foot mansion and a $41 million jet. But his next purchase would be the billionaire's prized possession. In January 2000, sports fanatic Mark Cuban bought majority ownership in the Dallas Mavericks from Ross Perot, Jr. It was the crowning purchase for the billionaire with the insatiable desire to win. Except that the franchise had one of the worst win-loss records of any team in the NBA. You've got to start giving these guys who have been in damaged programs, let's call them, the thought process that they can win, that they are expected to win. Cuban was going to change everything his way. Terdima Ussery, the buttoned-up CEO of the Dallas Mavericks, recalled his first meeting. I didn't eat the whole day because we're having dinner at his house that night, and I want to be a great guest. And I was in suit and tie, and... Uh, you know, trying to, my Sunday best, as my mom called it. Uh, he opened the door up in jeans and no shoes and T-shirt, and we sat on his floor and watched basketball uh, for four or five hours and ate. I think I think it was cocoa puffs and uh, Doritos is what we had in bottle of water. So, so it was again, it was just a new reality. That new reality took effect the moment Cuban saw the traditional wood-paneled locker room in the Mavericks' new arena. 
He said, you've got to blow this up. This is not what I want. I want a loft. I want open ceilings. I want the guys to feel like it's a clubhouse, a place they'd hang out in. we got to get a pool table in here, and we got to get the DVDs, rip everything out, and start again in the clubhouse. The radical new owner booked first-class hotels for road games and would buy a team jet with leg room for seven-footers. All that stuff was new. None of that stuff had been done in the league before. Nor had an owner worn a Mavs Fan for Life t-shirt or put his email address on the Jumbotron, or broken custom by ditching the skybox for courtside seats and yelling at the referees. No! FBI control at the timeout! FBI control at the timeout! Mark has said plenty that's gotten him in trouble. Scott Soshnick reports on sports business for Bloomberg News. My favorite one is when he said that a referee wasn't qualified to manage a Dairy Queen. But when he said that, Dairy Queen got upset. Uh, they wanted Mark to know that their managers are highly trained, highly skilled folks. And so uh, the guy challenged Mark to come down and serve ice cream and to see how difficult it really was. There were probably six helicopters hovering above this poor Dairy Queen. There were probably 3,000 people outside. And he was there dishing on ice cream. He's a very, very smart marketing guy. And if he can turn a negative into a positive, he will. But Cuban's courtside criticism was a negative for David Stern, the longtime commissioner of the NBA. I think Mark was very impatient when he first became an owner because he strives for perfection. And uh, he expressed his views in that regard. It wasn't a constructive enterprise to publicly criticize our officials, and it's prohibited by our rules. Those rules resulted in Cuban's first fine of $5,000, followed by fines of $15,000, $25,000, 250,000, 100,000, 10,000, and 100,000 again, all in his first full season as an owner. My job is to, to stand up for my, for my guys, and if I think something's wrong, I'm going to do something about it. Reporter John Swartz followed Cuban's career for 13 years. That connects with people. You don't see that among many billionaires. They think they have to act a certain way. I don't think he cares. I think he honestly just could give a damn what anyone thinks about him. Cuban's hands-on involvement brought immediate success. Attendance shot up more than 35%. The estimated team value leapt $50 million. And the Mavericks went to the playoffs in 2001 for the first time in over 10 years. Before he owned the Dallas Mavericks, they were the laughing stock of the NBA. They were winning 15 games a year. Once he took over, their winning percentage has got to be one of the best. It's got to be in the top five. Despite their surging success, that year the Mavericks fell short of the championship. And success for Cuban in the film and TV business was also proving elusive. At the dawn of HDTV in 2001, he launched the first high-definition television network called HDNet, as he explained to Charlie Rose. We're available on cable, we're available on satellite, but viewers can go knowing that not only they're going to get great entertainment, but they're going to get great entertainment in the best possible picture quality. The network sputtered, barely reaching 350,000 homes in its first year. Cuban hit pause long enough to marry longtime girlfriend Tiffany Stewart, throwing a reception bash on his home court, the American Airlines Center. By 2003, he re-teamed with Todd Wagner and plunged into the movie business. We bought Landmark Theaters, which was a national independent theater chain. We invested and then bought Magnolia Pictures, a theatrical distribution company. We built on a home entertainment unit as well to that. And all of a sudden, we had built a vertically integrated media company, meaning we had production, distribution, and exhibition all under one roof in a way that, frankly, we had not seen done before. It gave Cuban the pieces to shake up the movie business by releasing a film in theaters, on DVD, and TV simultaneously. Andy Fixmer is an entertainment reporter for Bloomberg News. Back then, nobody was doing this. Nobody even thought that you would dare put a movie on television before it was released in theaters. It just wasn't done. Cuban's movies met with mixed success. Some films, like Good Night and Good Luck, had found critical acclaim and a niche audience, while others struggled. And there was a disappointment again on the basketball court. Star Dirk Nowitzki led the team into the finals in 2006. 
the Mavs were up two games to none when momentum suddenly shifted. And the team dropped three straight. Cuban was livid. When he was pissed, he may as well have been Satan. The players literally ran the other way in the locker room. The Miami Heat are champions of the basketball world! After their collapse in the championship, Nowitzki publicly called for Cuban to control his temper. For the owner who hated to lose, the loss was pure devastation. I believe he didn't leave the house for three weeks, and he became a shut-in. So what did it cost him? It cost him his dream, really. His dream was to turn the Mavericks into champions. Mark Cuban, the former disco teacher, returned to dancing in 2007 in front of millions. Mark likes as much airtime as he can get. As long as it's fun and it's entertainment for him, he's going to do it. He appeared on almost anything, even hosting his own reality show, The Benefactor, canceled after one season. Viewers were also in short supply on his own network, with its strange blend of bikini-themed programming, mixed martial arts, and Dan Rather. Dan Rather and Dan Rather Reports on HDNet is kind of my own personal indulgence. You know, I'm, I'm a news junkie and always have been. Dan Rather was doing a show for them, which was actually very good. But the rest of it was just like a Sargasso Sea of just crap. Cuban had more troubles looming. The Securities and Exchange Commission filed a suit against him. We're going to turn now to the crackdown on insider trading, and it has ensnared billionaire Mark Cuban. The SEC alleged that Cuban dumped 600,000 shares of Mama.com as an insider trade. The 2008 lawsuit from the SEC says he sold shares of the company ahead of the company's own plans to sell more discounted shares to investors and avoided three quarters of a million dollars worth of losses. On his blog, Cuban stated the claims were false. The suit was dismissed in district court, but the SEC appealed and the case was reinstated in 2010. While Cuban battled in the courtroom, he also prepared for battle on the basketball court. He dealt for key players, hired a new coach, and in 2011, the Mavericks fought their way back to the finals. Surprising everyone, the loudmouth behind the team bench went silent. It was different. I mean, still people went up and talked to him, but he said, not today, not me, talk to the players. With Mark in the background, it was this other guy, Dirk Nowitzki, and the team that Mark had assembled that in the end was able to win. What he's always dreamed of. We had the ceremony inside the building, and all of a sudden this chant broke out, thank you, Mark, thank you, Mark, thank you, Mark. How many times have you heard of a building chanting thank you to the owner? That's pretty unique. With a championship banner finally in place, Cuban rebranded HDNet, calling it Access TV. In addition to Ryan Seacrest, Cuban partnered with two of the most powerful names in music and entertainment. He lives in Dallas with his wife and three children. On his personal blog, he sounds off on everything from executive compensation to personal health. Whether brilliant or just plain lucky, Mark Cuban will always be looking for his next big move. He's going to challenge conventions. He's going to change how people think. He's definitely a guy to always keep your eye on. He's brash. He's not afraid of controversy. But he's also one of the most brilliant strategic thinkers I've ever met. Is the glass of water half full or half empty? Mark's going to be the guy asking who's pouring it. You can look at things and say, this is the way they've always been done. I like to look at it and say, well, if everybody's doing this way, that's not where the future is. You have to look somewhere else. And, you know, if that pisses people off, that's their problem.